class and welcome to week eight. Last week we talked about behavioral learning theories, including theories by Pavlov and, um, and Skinner. This week, although it's in the same chapter, we focus on a different but slightly different aspect of this, which is called social cognitive learning theory. And this is a field largely created by the psychologist Albert Bandura. Albert Bandura, as you'll see, created, a, and originally it was called the social theory of learning, but it became the social learning, cognitive learning theory. Here's an example of our vocabulary preview. By the end of this lesson, you should know these vocabulary terms. And I remind you that there is that optional extra credit vocabulary uh, project. For certification purposes, you'll need to be able to apply social cognitive theory to manage behavior and learning in the classroom. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So this is a picture of Albert Bandura. He's a Canadian psychologist. Uh, currently, he teaches at Stanford University. He's known for the development of social cognitive theory and a concept called self-efficacy. Now, most of you probably know what self-confidence is. It's the ability to go out and do things and um, believe that overall you are a um, capable person. However, self-efficacy is a little bit different. Um, it's the belief in one's capabilities to organize and execute the courses of action required to manage prospective situations. In other words, it's believing yourself in, the, in yourself and in the, in the ability you have to take action. Usually when we talk about self-efficacy, we're talking about a specific subject. So you might, for example, have high self-efficacy in math and lower self-efficacy in science. It doesn't have to be a subject. It can also be things outside the classroom. You might have high self-efficacy and view your abilities as high in um, changing tires, uh, but low in needlepoint. Albert Bandura is the fourth most cited psychologist of all time. And uh, just wonder if you can guess the other three. I'll give you a hint. Uh, one of them is Freud. So let's turn to the social cognitive theory. So Bandura studied um, the Pavlovian theories and the Skinner Skinnerian theories. And so his early work was grounded in behavioral principles of punishment, reinforcement, and punishment. But he said, you know, I think those guys are missing a key piece of how and why we learn. So he added a focus call on learning that we do by observing others. And after that, he started calling his theories social learning theory. So he said, human beings are not just operating with rewards and punishments, but we do sometimes do things um, just because we watch others do it and it seems uh, pleasing to us and effective. So maybe in that sense, it's a reward, rewarding, but it, it's not for a physical reward necessarily. Even later, he, he focused on cognitive factors such as beliefs, self-perceptions, and expectations. So he said, you know, I can watch someone do something and not do that, maybe because I think it's dangerous. And somebody else watches something, someone do something, for example, break the law, and they might do it. Well, what's the difference? Well, he said it's individual uh, characteristics, such as their belief system, as we saw with Kohlberg, you know, there's the whole moral development piece, maybe how they perceive themselves as a risk taker or a rule breaker, and expectations maybe for income, for example. And so all of these things come together, observing others and internal characteristics. And so at that point, he changed the name of the, the theory from social learning to social cognitive theory. Cognitive, uh, he's referencing the piece about uh, cognitive factors, beliefs, self-perceptions, and expectations. Now, it's important to understand this theory. It's important to understand what modeling is. Modeling, we do this all the time in classrooms. It's demonstrating to students how to do something. So I might model, for example, um, how to use a microscope. 
But there are other uh, non-academic things I might model too. I might model how to walk good and well in line, for example. Um, but what else, if you think about it, so students pick up a lot of things from the teacher modeling. But what else are students picking up from maybe inadvertent modeling, both in and outside the classroom? Students also learn from observational modeling, watching the behavior of adults and their peers around them. So students learn from their, their families, from their friends, from their peers, from you as the teacher, from other adults in their lives. And they try to put all this together and think about, well, should I be doing that? There was a very famous experiment that Albert Bandura conducted with a Bobo doll. Now, for those of you who might not know what a Bobo doll is, uh, I gave my grandson one this past Christmas. It's basically a big inflatable doll about the size of a small child. And he's meant to be punched. You punch him and he goes down and he comes back up and you punch him again. And kids tend to love this bubble doll. Um, you're going to watch a video later describing Bandura's experiment. But in, in a brief summary, basically what he did is he took children, uh, participants, and he put them in a room with um, an adult. And there was a bubble doll in the room. And the children were told to stay on one side of the room. And the adult went to the other side. Now, in half the cases, uh, the, the adult would just sit there and play peacefully with the Bobo doll. In the other half of the cases, the adult would start to pound, I mean, viciously beat up the Bobo doll. And then the adult left the room. Uh, unbeknownst to the child, there were people watching him to see what his behavior would be. The child was um, told he could go to the other side of the room. And, and then his actions were recorded. Well, at the time that this experiment was conducted, I believe it was the 60s, it's either the 50s or the 60s, um, people thought that watching like violent TV shows was good for you because it was an outlet for aggression. And so they expected the child not to, to do anything different, uh, whether they saw the adult beat up the doll or not. But interestingly, what happened is it was a very marked um, and pronounced effect. The children who would watch the adult adults beat the Bobo doll would go over and pound the Bobo doll also. The children who saw the nonviolent uh, behavior by and large went over and played nonviolently with, um, with the doll. So this, uh, this effect has been replicated in many other experiments and in many other ways. And it, it was sort of groundbreaking because it led to this idea that maybe watching violent things isn't particularly good for children or maybe not even for adults. And that's a debate that's still going on today. Does watching violence cause one to be violent? There are some terms that are important to understand in social cognitive theory. Inactive learning is learning by doing and experiencing the consequences of your actions. So for example, if I want to learn um, how to sew, which is something I don't do very well, I have to plot along through lessons and I have to try to, to do the sewing. And at the end, usually I don't wind up with a very good product. So I see the consequences of my actions and I have to start again. Vicarious learning, however, is learning by observing others. So not doing it yourself, but watching others and what they do. If people can learn by watching, they must focus their attention, construct mental images about what's going on, remember those images, analyze them, and then finally make decisions about what they're going to do to affect learning. So I might be, um, for example, uh, I might have a friend and I might go to an ice cream parlor with that friend if I'm a student and we hang out. And uh, if the friend says, hey, look, the, the cash register is unattended. Let's go over and um, I'm going to go over and get some money for us. And then I watch my friend rob the cash register. I'm watching. I'm observing. 
The question is, will I learn that behavior and will I do it myself? And as I referenced before, there are other things, cognitive factors that come into play. My sense of who I am, my self-efficacy, my uh, beliefs about the world and about the universe. So I may or may not do that, but I have the potential to learn that by observation. So there are several stages of, uh, or elements of observational learning. If I'm watching the person rob the cash register, I have to pay attention to it. In teaching, hopefully we're not teaching behaviors like that, but if I'm asking students to learn by observation, I have to get their attention. And what I do is I, I usually have some signal to say, okay, we, we're gonna pay attention to this. And then um, I wanna ensure that students especially pay attention to the critical features of the lesson. A really good way to do this as you're going through the lesson, and, and let's say you're modeling uh, something, you want to highlight that important point with like, okay, this is really important to pay attention to. If you don't get this, it's difficult the rest of the lesson. After attention comes re retention, and that's uh, being able to retain what they've seen and remember it. This is where a mental rehearsal or independent practice comes in really handy. So if I'm teaching a math lesson and I've drawn their attention to word problems on the board and I go through and I show them how to solve it, then um, you have to get them to be able to practice that same procedure and, and follow it. So attention and retention are two important steps in observational learning. A third step is production. So after attention and retention, we want to focus on production or on knowing how the behavior should look and remembering the elements or steps. So going back to my um, going back to my math model, the first is the attention, showing them how to do it, to retention, maybe some guided practice, and third, production meaning getting them to do it independently on their own in a smooth and expert way. The fourth step is motivation and reinforcement. Um, so we might not, we might acquire the ability short term to do that behavior, but it's likely we won't practice it unless we are motivated and reinforced. So this is where the behavioral aspect of this theory comes in. So once students are doing something well, you're going to praise them, you're going to give them positive feedback so that they will want to continue to do that. If we anticipate that we're going to be reinforced for imitating the actions of a model, we may be more motivated to pay attention, remember, and reproduce behaviors. Now, going back to my robbing the cash register example, these steps follow for that as well, not only for positive learning, but for learning outcomes which perhaps we don't want to teach kids. So in that case, I've drawn a the friend has drawn attention uh, to the behavior of, mo of robbing the cash register. Uh, maybe she uh, gets me to go up and, and help her and sh she shows me how to unlock the drawer. She shows me how to secret the money away. Um, and then she encourages me to do it on my own. Motivation and reinforcement might come in by, hey, you're really cool. I want to hang out with you more. So it's important to understand that observational learning goes both ways, both with positive behavior and negative behavior. So we want to be careful what we're modeling to students in the classroom. There are different kinds of reinforcement for these behaviors. There's direct reinforcement where I actually try to reward uh, whoever is copying my behavior. Um, through praise or through extrinsic motivators. There's vicarious reinforcement. And this is when the observer simply sees others reinforced. So maybe I don't participate in the robbing of the cash register drawer, but I see that my friend has a lot of money and I have none. So I want that money. So maybe that's a vicarious reinforcement that will prompt me to do to be more aggressive next time. Self-reinforcement is one of the most important types of reinforcement we can teach students in the classroom. Um, 
this is where we try to get students to focus on reinforcement because they've learned something valuable and they enjoy their growing competence. So instead of using stickers and, and treats and pizza parties and things, which are effective sometimes, we want to transition students to more an internal self-reinforcement where they say, yeah, I'm really getting better at this. I enjoy growing more competent. I feel like I'm, this is of value to me. Uh, and so that's self-reinforcement. One of the things we want to produce is self-management. Now, young students have a hard time with this, but as they get older, particularly moving into the middle school and high school years, we can start to teach the rudiments of self-management. If one goal of education is to produce people who are capable of educating themselves, then students must learn to manage their own lives, set their own goals, and provide their own reinforcement. Um, if you don't do this, then students graduate and they continue to expect rewards. And when they go into the workplace, as you well know, those rewards are not the same. Uh, people aren't handing out stickers and bonuses and treats for doing a job. People say, come in and do your job. And the job itself needs to be rewarding. In adult life, rewards are sometimes vague and goals often take a long time to reach. Think about how many baby steps are required to complete an education. So you're going through this now. I mean, you had to decide that you wanted to go to school. You want, had to select a college. You had to register. You had to pay tuition and buy books. And you have to do that over and over again for a while. Um, and so there are many, many steps. And students need to be taught how to break large goals down into manageable steps and put one foot in front of the other and what I call baby steps going forward. It can be overwhelming if they think about a long-term project, for example. But the more you can help them break the, the long-term project down into manageable steps and monitor those steps and see them putting one foot in front of the other going forward, the easier it is. Uh, so for example, an assignment in this course is the EdTPA assignment. And so rather than have you just do that all on your own and submit that, um, I had you break it into parts, part one, part two, part three. And so part of the management of that is giving you feedback so that you can do a better job going forward and the end product is something you can be proud of. So what are the implications of social cognitive learning theory? Well, basically it comes down to two things. You want to model desired behavior, whether that's academic behavior or how to do something how to, when you're teaching them. And you're going to be probably talking out loud of, during the modeling. OK, here's how I do the model microscope. I, you know, I carefully take my slide. I don't drop it. I put it under the, um, the, the um, I put it under the lens and et cetera. You'd be talking those steps out loud. Uh, but it also applies to non-academic behavior. So how should you dress? How should you speak of others? How should you, um, how should you handle fairness? Students watch that and copy it too. It's also about providing good role models for students to follow. So talking and reading about uh, individuals in your classroom that made a difference in this area. You need to encourage students to set goals. There's been a lot of research on goal setting, and we know it's one of the most powerful things you can do. Um, so setting goals that are not too lofty and not too little. So for example, this time I got a 90 on a math test. Next time, I'm going to try to get a 95. And to do that, I'm going to put in you know, 20 minutes more at night. So you need to teach them to break the, break down their ideas about what they want to do and, um, and have specific uh, action items that they can take to achieve it. Encourage students to make good choices academically and socially that will further those goals. So is it really the best time tonight, you might say to Marty, uh, to go out and party when you know you have a big test coming up tomorrow? 
Work with students to come up with manageable steps that will enable them to achieve their goals. And this could take the form of a contract um, uh, or something simply written in their planners. I used to check those and I would have mom and dad check them off as well. Teach them self-regulation. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more on the next couple of slides, but it's basically how to check in and monitor their own progress. So if, if they don't know what they're doing or where they are in their progress, they're just going to be thrashing about uh, wildly. They won't understand why things are happening to them, but teaching them about goals and steps and monitoring those, those steps is a really first good step to teaching them to, um, to turn assignments in on time and to do other things. Teach students about cognitive behavior modifications. And this is the combination of behavioral and cognitive mod behavior modifications to achieve desired behavior. So teaching students to set goals and then reward themselves, for example, for meeting those goals. Um, is a really good way to, to encourage independence. And then teaching students how to self-reinforce. So your text talks about self-regulated learning, and it provides a very good model called uh, Meckenbob's model of self-regulated learning. It has five steps to it. Any teacher can implement this in the classroom, and indeed many teachers implement this naturally. So let's say I have to um, teach again how to, um, or let's say, let's change it up, how to teach, I'm going to teach how to write a five paragraph essay. So what I could do the first day is I could talk about what is a five paragraph essay, and I could have my, um, my smart board or my overhead on, and I could ask students to give me a topic to write about, and I could write the five paragraph essay on the overhead while I'm talking out loud. And it would go something like this. Okay, you gave me a topic of um, manatees. I really like manatees, so I'm going to use that topic. Let's see, the first paragraph has to have an introductory sentence. So what would be a good introductory sentence for manatees? And then try to prompt students in their discussion but if you can't, if they can't come up with a good one, you could provide one and provide the introductory sentence. Okay, the second thing the introductory paragraph has to do is to preview the, the next paragraphs. So I'm going to come back to that in a little bit uh, when I've done that. So let's go to the second paragraph, et cetera. And I would just write the essay up on top. Then what I would do is I would ask students to work with me in small groups and have them pick a topic in each group. And I would have them performing the task uh, of, of, of the same thing, doing it on their own with me prompting them again using out loud modeling. And then I would have them write on their own while talking out loud, repeating the steps. Then I would have them write again, but this time they're going to whisper the steps. And then I would have them write again, but this time they do it mentally. They're saying the steps mentally. So you've transitioned from me doing it, everything and talking out loud to the students doing it and talking mentally quietly to themselves. And this would be over several lessons. Um, and so you can see you could really do this with anything you're trying to teach them, whether it be um, how to prepare for tests and study vocabulary, to, like I said, how to set up a microscope and use it, to um, how to analyze uh, text in a, in a reading class, many, many things you could have them do this with. So what are some of the implications of all this? Um, it, one of the things you should not forget is that children learn from more than just you by observing. Children learn a lot of things from their families. So if the family is reinforcing the idea that self-management is important, if they're communicating with you uh, on a regular basis through perhaps the signed planner or the contract 
about self-management, then children are going to be more likely to, um, to adhere to, to those self-management principles. Working together, teachers and parents can focus on a few goals and at the same time, the growing independence of students. That's all for this week. So hope you enjoyed the lecture and the rest of the module.